Israel, the setting for an intense power play between the forces of religion, politics and money, with consequences that can affect all of us, whoever and wherever we are in the world. This episode of God's Business examines what happens when a significant new force is introduced into the game of faith, identity and power in this volatile land on the shores of the Mediterranean. Israel just has to be the most diverse small nation on earth. We focus on its wars with its neighbours, but at times it seems to be at war with itself. Wave after wave of immigrants have been invited to come here and help build the Jewish homeland. Most of them, it seems, want to be able to enjoy living the Mediterranean life. They've come from all over the world, from America, North and South, from Europe, West and East, the Middle East. From Lithuania, Poland, Brazil, Iran, Iraq, everywhere. The latest wave of immigration poses perhaps the greatest challenge of all to a coherent idea of what the Israeli state, the Jewish state, should be. More than one and a quarter million people have arrived from the former Soviet Union in little more than a decade, bringing with them their traditions, culture and language, and their strong spirit of independence. They call them the Russians, but the people who come here from the former Soviet Union are almost as diverse as those who were here before them. As well as from Russia, they come from Georgia, Uzbekistan, Chechnya and the Ukraine. Some hardly knew they were Jews, some were able to maintain their Jewishness under Soviet rule. But however varied their backgrounds, one thing they have in common is a sense of pride, a cultural confidence. I've rarely seen a more confident display of pride and cultural confidence than the birthday party of Anastasia Mikhaili, a recent arrival from Russia who is celebrating in the company of several hundred of her closest friends, many of them members of the cultural and media elite of the Russian community in Israel. But by far the most important names on Anastasia's guest list come from Israel's political establishment. And the most important guest of all is the leading elder statesman, Shimon Peres. He is a former prime minister and currently the vice prime minister. So what gives Anastasia, who has lived here for less than a decade, such extraordinary upward mobility? Her first success as a model and then as a television host of the Russian language TV station Channel 9 quickly made her a prominent figure in the Russian branch of Israeli society. So the leaders of Kadima, the new ruling party of Israel, saw her as a potential vote winner and they invited her to stand for the Knesset, the national parliament. She hasn't been elected yet, but with her high profile and networking skills, the word is that it's only a matter of time. Even the Prime Minister, Ehud Olmert, has sent a birthday greeting on video. Unfortunately, the sound is so bad that no one can hear him properly. But it's the thought that counts. I think that the person who wants to, succeed, to have success, it, it has success. You should have success because you need to believe. When you have the goal and you go there, you will be successful everywhere. Ten years ago, when I came here for the first time, I felt that it's my country. And uh, I decided to stay here with my husband. He came to here in uh, 72, when he was a small child. Marrying Yusuf Samuelson, a multi-millionaire businessman of Russian Jewish origin, has certainly not hindered Anastasia's progress. Yosef is not one of the notorious Russian oligarchs who have built themselves a safe haven in Israel he has established a more modest fortune in property development, much of it in Russia. Anastasia was not born Jewish herself, but since her marriage, she's become a convert and has thus passed on Jewish identity to her six children. By intriguing coincidence, the influx of a million and a quarter mostly Jewish newcomers to Israel matches the million and a quarter Israelis of Arab origin, who some Israelis see as an enemy within. 
One of the party guests, Ranan Gissin, who's a political consultant and one-time Israeli government spokesman, sees the new Russian immigrants as a bulwark against Israel's enemies. And in 1948, you know, all the, uh, I would say, famous analysts in the United States and elsewhere around there predicted the country will survive only for six months because it was invaded by seven Arab armies and had no natural resources. But it had one resource that they didn't put into, that's the human resource. And definitely one million uh, Russian immigrants that came to Israel uh, in the 90s and to the year 2000. And hopefully another million that we'll bring in are going to tip the balance and actually give us the edge uh, in our ability to survive in a rather hostile environment. Of course, Anastasia's dazzling progress cannot be replicated by most of the people who have come to Israel as immigrants. But one thing all Israelis share is the knowledge that this is a country in a state of perpetual war. For a few noisy minutes, the underlying realities of the Middle East intrude into the celebrations, as Israeli jets scream overhead, presumably on a bombing mission to the north. This intrusion into everyone's consciousness is made even stronger, because on this particular evening, Israel is on the verge of invading Lebanon, and has already started a bombing campaign. The short war between Israel and the Lebanese militia Hezbollah was to prove traumatic for all parties, including the usually confident Israelis. Unsurprisingly, it filled people's minds throughout my trip to Israel, and it filled the schedules of Channel 9, Israel's most prominent Russian-language TV station, the channel that made Anastasia a household name. At Channel 9, I get to meet another young television presenter of Russian origin. And, like Anastasia, Natasha Mozgovaya is attractive, blonde and successful. When I meet her, she is filming an historical documentary. But her experience as a war reporter has colored her view of life in Israel. It's, it's very uh, cynical to say this, but uh, the Palestinian-Israel conflict is... Uh, it's kind of conflict deluxe, with all these tanks and the explosions and uh, and dead people, and and the real pain. Well, this place for me as a journalist is so fascinating that uh, it's very hard to move out because every every month, every week, every day you have something. Natasha arrived in Israel as part of the big wave of immigration in the early 90s. This latest aliyah, as the Israelis call it, or ascension, was triggered by the collapse of the Soviet Union. For a million Russian Jews, Israel presented itself as a refuge from anarchy. So I came here with my mother when I was 11 years old. Well, the absorption here for the young people is not very easy. And uh, you're not exactly coming home uh, you know, and uh, you're uh, welcomed. Uh, you're supposed to find a job, you're supposed to, to, to learn a language, and uh, the social mobility is, uh, is very problematic. So, uh, so it's a regular immigration. Some Russian immigrants have got stuck at the bottom of the economic pile, but the majority have established themselves in fast-growing cities like Ashdod, bright and clean, if a little soulless. Yet even among those who have prospered, there can be a feeling of alienation, of not being fully accepted by Israeli society. They feel themselves accused of being arrogant and not fully committed to the state of Israel or even to the Jewish heritage. In strong contrast to the first Russian immigrants in Israel who came as Zionist pioneers at the turn of the 20th century. Some groups here didn't really like Russians. So I heard a lot of, uh, lots of times, uh, like, why did you Russians came here and so on. Like every, every wave of immigration here receives uh, uh, such a warm welcoming. <laughs> but uh, for me, I don't know, I didn't understand. What, what have I done? Like, what did I do wrong? It wasn't my decision to come here, it was my mother. So why do you have to tell me that you stink Russians go back to Russia? 
One of the most provocative examples of the independent spirit displayed by the Russian immigrants is the way that they have ignored that most emblematic expression of Jewish identity, kosher food. The pork products in the supermarkets that Russians frequent offer a truly amazing spectacle. Israelis, when they were waiting to greet here Russian Jews, they had some kind of uh, nostalgia from their grand-grandparents that built this country, the first and the second Aliyah. And then they, um, they met a million of people, very cynical and uh, not, not always Zionist, and with their problems and stereotypes. And um, the people that were integrated well economically, but segregated totally culturally. So I think the Israeli society had a big problem to, to understand this phenomenon. About Russians, it's very, very popular to say the Russian immigration is a blessing for Israel. But as, uh, as the old saying here goes, uh, we like Aliyah, but we don't really like Olim. Like we like uh, the immigration because it's, you know, it's a survival need, but we don't like um, immigrants. Some corners of Jerusalem were established more than a hundred years ago by ultra-Orthodox Jews from Russia and from parts of Europe that were to be absorbed into the Soviet Empire. Here, a deeply religious life is still fiercely maintained, a strong contrast to the sausage counters of Ashdod. Some Israelis argue that the million and more Russians who arrived in the most recent Aliyah can hardly be considered Jews at all detached as they have become from their religious tradition by centuries of violent anti-Semitism and the militant atheism of the communist years. But I meet a group of people eager to rediscover their Jewish identity. They come together each week for lessons in Judaism. The teacher tonight is a distinguished rabbi, Rav Eliyahu Esses. We want to create a corridor how to enter the Jewish society, how to enter the Jewish tradition. We are Israeli citizens, this, the state is state, everything is okay, but tradition you cannot buy uh, in the shop, you can buy a book, you cannot buy tradition. You have to enter somehow. Back in the 70s and 80s, Rav Eliyahu was one of those rare and brave Russians who committed themselves to rediscovering their Jewish birthright despite being punished by the Soviet system. They were known as the Refuseniks. The rabbi's life had been transformed when he first read the words of Moses in the Torah. Suddenly, uh, I started to feel not heavenly voices, nothing of this sort. Simply in heart, in my heart, a warm feeling that the words of Moses were also for me, not some, you know, some mystical direct speech to me, but simply powerful words of wisdom, you know, uh, deep thought and ethical uh, morals and uh, ethical way of life. And it was for me as a Jew, as any Jew. He was Jewish, Moses, and I am Jewish. So we had this it cannot be dialogue, but sort of a voice from 3,000 years ago that I understood very deeply, I want to live this way of life. The rabbi was eventually allowed to leave the Soviet Union, and he arrived in what he had long dreamed of as the holy city of Jerusalem. I came, I'm at home. That's it. From this second, I'm at home. Before. A wandering Jew, you know, in the deserts, whatever. From this second, I'm at home. And this feeling is still today. Has it been what you'd hoped it would be? Are Israelis what you'd hoped they'd, they'd be? Much less spiritual. As, as Israel, as society in general, and I'm talking about really, society in general is much less spiritual, much more materialistic, and uh, much less idealistic as I would expect. But for some of the rabbi's pupils, Israel is beyond criticism. This magical feeling that you're protected here. Yeah. And you just feel it, that's all. Don't need any explanation. 
you just feel it. So, so even though there are no protection here. So even though there's fighting in in down south in Gaza and danger from the West Bank and whatever, you don't feel that anxious about any of that. No, I, I visited many times France and uh, in other country I was like without skin, you know. Here I have my skin. One student came to Israel with her Jewish husband, although she is not Jewish herself. Now she has decided to become a convert, with Rav Eliyahu as her spiritual guide. But in Israel, conversion is not a one-way street. My ex-husband, Juju, without any doubt. And this magic land, doing magic things with people. I'm not Jew, almost no, not Jew. I decided to be a Jew. My ex-husband, after divorce, it, it happened six, six years ago, he became a Christian. He now has a uh, no, beard and everything and cross and uh, special candles and he's going to a Christian temple. And, uh, but for, for me, better he, he'll know the God by this way than don't know the God at all. Because the Bible the same, almost the same. There are said to be more than 200,000 Russian Orthodox believers in Israel today, most of them linked to Jews through marriage or family descent. I come across several groups of them worshipping alongside their fellow Christians at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, the site of the Tomb of Christ. I witness these Russian immigrants placing valued personal objects on the stone where they believe the body of Christ was washed after the crucifixion. They are hoping to draw spiritual power from this sacred place. By coincidence, there are about 200,000 Orthodox Christians of Palestinian descent in Israel and the occupied territories. It's anyone's guess what impact this rapid influx of newcomers from Russia will have on Christianity in the Holy Land. But there are already rumors that the Russian Orthodox hierarchy are trying to increase their influence. The ultimate effect that all of the million and a quarter Russian immigrants will have on this volatile corner of the world is also an open question. Is their very diversity likely to dilute their influence? Or will they eventually develop a unified voice, a Russian voice? One place where that unified voice is starting to be heard is in politics. Yosef Chagall, like Anastasia Michaeli, is a former Channel 9 journalist and presenter who has been invited to stand for parliament. Unlike Anastasia, Yosef was elected at his first attempt. He is now one of 11 Knesset members of the Yisrael Bitenu party, which is part of the government. Today, Yosef Chagall addresses the residents of a home for elderly Russians. The mood in the room is one of intransigence towards Arabs, a mood made more intense by the fact that Israel is, at the time of the meeting, being bombarded from across the Lebanese border. One resident, who's a veteran of the Soviet Union's hard-won victory over the Nazis during the Second World War, says that Israel should not negotiate with its enemies in Lebanon, Syria or Iran, but defeat them in battle and then talk. Yosef Chagall suggests that he and the Yisrael Bitenu party agree with this pugnacious approach. But the party policy that has caused the most comment, provoking accusations of racism, even fascism, deals with the fate of Israel's own Arab community. Just like the Russians, the Arabs make up about 20% of Israel's population. Yosef Chagall and his colleagues argue that the borders of Israel should be redrawn 
so that many of the main Arab population centers become designated as occupied territories, or, if it is ever established, become part of the Palestinian state. This argument convinces many Russian immigrants. Ни для кого не секрет, и все прекрасно в Израиле это знают, просто не все об этом говорят, что это абсолютно обособленное. It's no secret, and everybody in Israel knows about it. But not everyone speaks about it, that the Arabs are a separate population, a colony, which is absolutely closed off in the tight boundaries of its ethnic identity. This population does not only fail to participate in the life of a country, but places itself at a distance. So what are we talking about? We're saying that unfortunately, and it's a great shame, that the Arab sector is not an integral part of the state of Israel. Yosef Shigal, born in Azerbaijan and living in Israel for just a dozen years, argues that native-born Israeli citizens should have their citizenship withdrawn if they do not declare their complete loyalty to the state. So, the Russians of Israel may be diverse, proud, and insist on living on their own terms, and they may even dramatically change Israeli society. But whatever happens, the Russians are here to stay, and they are determined that Israel is here to stay too. But some Russians are reluctant to commit themselves to a life of perpetual conflict. I'm thinking about my kid, but I've seen too many two-year-old kids torn apart and five-year-old kids shot and from both sides, okay? I don't think that any, any ideology, any state, any... I don't know, anything justifies sacrifice of, of your family, your, ch your child or something like this. I can't stand the people that are saying that my son didn't die in vain, because for me, everyone that dies in war, dies in vain. 